How many of you believe that place can make you happy? <laughs> well, you're not alone. When I was writing my book, Healing Spaces, The Science of Place and Well-Being, I sat next to a dinner party, to a, a gentleman at a dinner party in Washington, D.C., and he asked me what I do, and I said, I'm writing a book on how place and space around you can make you happy or make you stressed, and in turn can affect your health. And he said, oh, we used to do that all the time. And I said, who are you and what did you do? And he said, I used to be vice president of Disney Imagineering. <laughs> so he started to explain to me in great detail how the original Disney Imagineers designed every element of place in those theme parks to take people from a place of anxiety and fear to one of hope and happiness. And I said to him, you know, it would be a whole lot easier for me to understand if I had a behind-the-scenes tour of Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> and through the magic of Disney, here I am, probably the only nerd in the theme park carrying a pad and pencil, but I'm happy. <laughs> through time immemorial, people have dreamed of a happy healing place, and they call that paradise. In fact, if you Google the word paradise, you get 211 million images in 0.21 seconds, and most of these are views of nature. And in fact, scientific studies show that views of nature do improve mood. In the landmark study in the inner city projects of Chicago, Kuo and Sullivan showed that people who were randomly assigned to apartments with a view of a grove of trees had more positive interactions with their neighbors, less violent and aggressive behaviors than those who were assigned to apartments with a view of a blacktop. So how could this be? Is it what you see? Is it what you hear? Is it what you smell? Is it what you do in that space? Is it all of the above? Of course, it's all of the above that affects your moods. In science, we can break down each of these points into its smallest controllable parts. So let's talk about what you see. Even if I'm tired or stressed when I'm driving home from work, which I never am because I love my job and I love Tucson, when I look at these mountains, the Santa Catalina Mountains, I turn off the radio and I just watch them, and I feel calm. And there's a reason for this. There's a part of the brain that recognizes beautiful views. You know, the brain is not a bowl of mush. There are parts of the brain that recognize faces and things and animals and tools. There's a part of the brain that recognizes beautiful views. And this is universal. Preferred scenes tend to be sweeping views of nature. And it turns out that that part of the brain is rich in endorphins. So Irving Biederman at the University of Cal Southern California has a theory that perhaps the reason we will all pay more for a room with a view is because we're giving ourselves a shot of endorphins when we look at it. What about color? Probably most of our associations of blues and greens with calming and reds and yellows with excitement are learned associations. And we know that from studies that show that people can unlearn those associations, mostly involving alcohol. <laughs> but evolutionary biologists believe that perhaps the default mode is in your genes. And the reason is because the genes for the color receptors for red came online most recently exactly at the same time as primates began eating fruit. So perhaps there was a survival advantage for those who could recognize the luscious, desirable red fruit on the forest background of green. Odors and mood are also mostly learned. A colleague at the University of Arizona shared a story with me that when she moved out east, she so missed the sweet smell of the creosote bushes after the rain that she came home and she brought back a sprig of creosote with her back east and hung it in the shower whenever she felt homesick. But odors are also chemicals that actually affect brain function. So lavender is relaxing, and it also induces slow-wave sleep in animals. So if place can make you happy, can it also make you well? How many of you believe that? 
I certainly believe it because I experienced it, as you heard, when I went to Greece after I developed arthritis and began to heal. And that's when I start to ask myself, what was it about that experience that helped me heal? There are studies, the landmark study done in 1984 by Roger Ulrich showed that patients who had a view of a grove of trees out their window when they were recovering from gallbladder surgery healed on average a day sooner, needed less pain medication, and had fewer negative nurse's notes than those who had a view of a brick wall. So the flip side of this is that place can also stress you. Elements of place that can stress you are crowding, noise, light, too much, too little, foul odors, mazes. Does that remind you of any particular kind of building? How many of you associate a hospital with a calming, healing spa? My goal, and our goal at the University of Arizona Institute on Place and Well-Being, is to come to a point when I can ask that question to an audience and I don't get a laugh. And the reason is this. We know that stress can make you sick. Chronic stress increases the frequency and severity of viral infections, decreases vaccine take rate, so if you go out to get a vaccine, you're less protected, slows wound healing, speeds cancer growth, and speeds chromosomal aging. So it doesn't make sense to take a person who's already anxious and already stressed and put them into a place where they're going to be more so. So what can we do about it? We can design elements of place at all scales in all buildings that reduce stress and enhance well-being. So I'll show you a few examples. This is the Diamond Children's Hospital here in Tucson, Arizona. It's built with beautiful views of the Santa Catalina Mountains, even in the intensive care waiting room area. A mother shared with me while she was waiting for her child that even though she was extremely stressed, she felt at peace and calm sitting there. This is a view of the mountains from the Tucson Medical Center. Tucson Medical Center here started as a tuberculosis sanatorium. And in the tradition in the 1930s and, and before of tuberculosis sanatoria, they had views of the mountains. They have patios where patients could uh, sit and walk outside their rooms. Places for family and loved ones to sit and join their, their, their ill uh, uh, patients and friends and areas for social support, which is so important in health. The US military is embracing these concepts. We're working with the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda to create a green road, a healing forest glen for wounded warriors who live on base to move from their residences to the hospital to be treated instead of going along a busy urban street. And the military is also putting in labyrinths. These are walking meditations to calm and heal for wounded warriors who have post-traumatic stress disorder and traumatic brain injury. The Center for Health Design in San Francisco has done studies looking at retrofits in 50 different hospitals around the country that incorporated these kinds of interventions and have found significant improvements in health outcomes and also improved staff and patient satisfaction. And what's good for the patients and the staff is good for the bottom line. They calculated that the extra $12 million that needed to be spent up front to create such a fable hospital could be recouped in the first year of operation. We did studies with the General Services Administration that builds all the government buildings and maintains them. 2.4% of all buildings in the United States are built and maintained by the GSA. We showed that people in new retrofitted office space that was light and airy and had beautiful views had significantly lower stress levels on two different measures of the stress response. 
In fact, the GSA has gone on to retrofit their headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C. to include these beautiful light and airy spaces with views of the Potomac and the monuments, and even workspaces for people on the roof deck garden. All of this is true at the urban scale as well. Cities are including uh, sidewalks and boardwalks for people to walk. Exercise is so important in health. Tucson is an incredibly health conscious health destination city. We have uh, bike paths, we have sidewalks, soon we'll have the modern streetcar. We're downtown here where we can walk around. This is an amazingly healthy space and has been for thousands of years. Chicago has many parks for people to exercise. If you don't have space for a park, you can go to this roof garden in downtown Los Angeles. Cabrini Green, in the inner city of Chicago was anything but green, more bullets whizzing by than leaves dropping off of trees. And the Fourth Presbyterian Church worked with the city of Chicago and the community to create a city farm, a garden, for the children in the community to help grow the vegetables and participate in summer camp activities. Here in Tucson, the Tucson Unified School District is working together with the University of Arizona to institute these similar kinds of gardens. And the smiles on the faces of these children say it all. And this is true in higher education as well. This is an example. This is the, uh, the Sonoran Desert Garden outside the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. It attracts students to study in it in what used to be a parking lot. All of this has tremendous implications for green and sustainable policy and design. This is the future of sustainable design. The major standard setting and licensing bodies in the design professions, the American Institute of Architects, the US Green Building Council that sets LEED certification for green buildings, the General Services Administration, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, and international organizations are all now including human health and well-being outcomes as we set new standards for green and sustainable buildings. We want to know that the place around us helps us heal and keeps us well, as well as helping the planet. The challenge is to get the data to measure quantitatively whether, how, and when the environment affects health. And in order to do this, we need non-invasive measures. It wouldn't do for me to draw blood as you walk around in the middle of the street, right? So we need non-invasive measures, and the future is here. The future is here because we have those technologies, technologies that can measure the stress and relaxation response, activity, all sorts of measures of health. We can measure environmental features like light, sound, uh, wind speed, and on and on. And we can track these in real time and real place to really know how every element of space affects our health. The future we talk about in medicine is person-centered health, mobile health. I propose that the real frontier in medicine is person and place-centered well-being. Let's call it M well-being. Here at the University of Arizona, we're developing an institute on place and well-being, linking the College of Medicine, the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, the College of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape Architecture, and virtually every college and institute and center across the university to bring design and health professionals together to partner in research, in curriculum, in partnering with the community, and with the private sector to create places and spaces that enhance health and well-being. Even if you don't have access to a major organization, you can create your own happy place. Even if it's just a little office cubicle, you can put bright colored wallpaper on the walls, you can paste pictures of favorite places 
on the wall. You can put little dish gardens and flowering plants there and create your own little happy place. My father didn't have the luxury of going to a beautiful place, nor of looking out the window at a beautiful view, nor of pasting a picture of a favorite place on his wall in World War II. But he had a favorite psalm, the 23rd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. My father walked through the valley of the shadow of death somewhere in a concentration camp in a place called Transnistria. And this psalm gave him solace. It took him to a healing place. And so can it all for all of us, no matter where we are in our lives, even if we are in the valley of the shadow of death, we can go to that healing place by reading a favorite poem, by reading a favorite psalm, or by saying a prayer. Thank you.